Ladies and gentlemen, you are very welcome to the fourth annual Anscombe Memorial Lecture here at St. Hugh's, where Elizabeth Anscombe was an undergraduate. The lecture is, is organised by the Anscombe Bioethics Centre with the co-sponsorship of Blackfriars Hall. This afternoon's lecturer is uh, Professor Anselm Muller, who is going to speak to us on the spiritual nature of man. I think it's fair to say that Professor Muller is, has a particularly fine pedigree as a, an Anscombe Memorial lecturer. He was, after all, um, a student uh, working under the supervision of the very first Anscombe Memorial lecturer, uh, Professor Sir Anthony Kenny, who is with us as, uh, this afternoon, and Elizabeth Anscombe, uh, in whose memory uh, we have uh, these lectures. For those of you who have come specially for this lecture, uh, I should say a few words uh, about Professor Muller. Uh, he began his philosophical studies at the University of Fribourg, where he obtained his PhD, and worked also under the supervision of Anthony Kenny and Elizabeth Anscombe, and became a, a lecturer in philosophy at Balliol College for four years, moving on eventually to the U University of Trier, where he was an assistant professor and later a full professor, and he remained there till 2007. Professor Muller has held a visiting research uh, fellowship at Corpus Christi College, Oxford. He is a member of the Wittgenstein Trust, and he is a regular visiting professor at the University of Chicago. If you don't know German, I should say that uh, Professor Muller's work is an incentive to learn German, although he has also published extensively in English on uh, the philosophy of mind and action, on bioethics, moral philosophy, and political philosophy. The structure of this afternoon is going to be the standard one. Professor Muller will speak for uh, just under an hour, and there will be an opportunity for questions afterwards. So without further ado, I uh, invite uh, Professor Muller to come forward. Thank you. I feel very honored to have been invited to give this lecture in memory of my teacher, Mr. Dansford. Uh, I'm also very glad to, well, thanks to, uh, to David Jones and Chita and his staff for arranging uh, the visit. And I'm glad to, to see so many people that I know, and to, of course, very glad to be back in Oxford. Uh, but I discovered that there are only two faces that uh, I met here when I came almost 50 years ago for the first time. And these are the face of Dr. Mary Beach, who was a girl of 14 at the time. And then there's, of course, uh, Tony, my friend Tony, who was my first supervisor. And I think it was very good for me to have him for the first two terms before I was uh, delivered into the hands of the dance. <coughs> In a collection of tales from ancient Persia, we read, a man went to the shop of a bird dealer in order to offer a parrot for sale. How much do you want for the parrot? The dealer asked. A hundred toman, he answered. What? exclaimed the dealer. How can you ask for a hundred toman for such a small bird? Well, said the owner of the bird, this is a particularly able one. It talks. But the dealer still said it was far too expensive and did not want to buy it. During their conversation, the owner of the parrot noticed a turkey sitting in one of the dealer's cages. How much do you want for it? He asked the dealer. A hundred to man. You really want a hundred to man for an ordinary bird like this? Why not, the dealer said. If your bird talks, mine thinks. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth Anson would have liked this tale. 
She was a great lover of funny stories, especially if they had a philosophical point. The point of this story is a rather straightforward one. Nobody would ascribe thought to an animal in the absence of relevant behavior in appropriate circumstances. By the same token, you should not describe as, as, describe as speech the vocal performances of a parrot in the absence of relevant behavior in appropriate circumstances. What, however, is it that makes us humans unique among animals as thinkers and language users? Anthem calls this distinctive feature spirituality. In today's lecture, I hope to introduce you to the ramifications of this notion, and in particular to explore what she maintains is the center of our spiritual nature, namely our capacity for truth and goodness. <coughs> this brings me to section two on your hand. In her article, The Political Philosophy and the Spirituality of Man, Anska reminds us of the kind of behavior and circumstances that go with human thinking. Thoughts are typically expressed in words, but words cannot acquire and convey their meanings unless their conventional use is kept in place by the kind of behavior and circumstances that typically go with them. Whence the inappropriateness of describing speech to the parent. Moreover, thought, thoughts can be manifested by behavior, even in the absence of verbal manifestation, verbal articulation. I'm quoting, one can even see someone thinking something. Anselm imagines a piece of behavior that can be translated into the words, this pencil is blunt, oh well, it will do. And she gives the example of someone, again quote, someone doing a jigsaw puzzle, where one wants to say, he just had the thought, perhaps it will fit in this place, but the other way round. The player has been trying the piece in a certain position, then his glance shifts, he gives a slight start, turns the piece round, and tries to fit it in. End of quote. Yet one of the same sort of behavior, such as handing something over to someone may mean different things and thus manifest different thoughts. This can be taken as a first indication that there is more to thoughts than patterns of behavior and hence, and hence behaviorism is wrong. Although we have not yet arrived here at a case of thinking that is not embedded in any immediately surrounding behavior at all. Anselm's own example of an ambivalent embedding, as we might call it, is taken from Wittgenstein, who considers the thought that is involved in pointing. This thought determines, quote, what is being pointed to, whether to the shape of some object, to the kind of stuff it is made of, its color, or whatever else may be in question, end of quote. How precisely do, the, do these alternative pointings differ from each other? Anska notes that no discriminating experience needs to go with any particular kind of pointing. Quote, and even if there was an experience which did happen in all such cases, it would still depend on the circumstance, that is, on what happened before and after the pointing, whether we would say that the pointing was a case of pointing to the shape, not to the color. Nonetheless, we are tempted to postulate an inner or mental pointing that resolves the ambivalence of the pointing done by finger, and to ascribe that inner pointing to a spiritual substance or spirit or an immaterial part, much as we ascribe, as it seems, the outer pointing to a body or bodily part, something material. Following Wittgenstein, Anselm rejects an account on these lines. Thought is not an immaterial activity taking place in an immaterial medium 
in a sort of immaterial matter, as she expresses herself. On the other hand, again, like Wittgenstein, she is not a behaviorist. Who would want to translate an ascription of thought into an ascription of behavior? Moreover, she also rejects the view that thinking is at least of necessity and therefore always carried by or embedded in a context made up from behavior plus circumstances. As, is, as it actually is in the case of the jigsaw puzzle. And more particularly, she denies that thinking, is typ thinking typically consists in physical occurrences in the way that, for example, paying or winning do. According to Anspin, any attempt on such lines to reduce thought to something else will fail to fit the kind of thinking represented by Auguste Rodin's thinker. Cases of thinking which have nothing to do with one's surroundings or with any activities in which one is currently engaged. These are cases in which one says things like, at that moment I had the thought. In view of such cases, we have to accept the possibility of unembedded, uncarried thoughts, the possibility of as I'm quoting, assignments by speakers of various thoughts to particular times, regardless of there being any events around about those times, the totality of which materially carry the thinking. End quote. But in saying this, Anson seems to leave us with an unsolved problem, namely, how does Rodin's thinker differ from the dealer's turkey. Why ascribe thoughts to the former, but not the latter? Well, a thinker of flesh and blood is unlikely to maintain the posture recommended by Rodin for very long. What you are thinking right now may indeed not be manifested in any surroundings or behavior, but the wider context of your present thinking including the occasional later, later report, shows you to be a thinking animal and supplies a background for attributing to you secret thoughts <coughs> besides the ones that, you can, that can be ascribed to you on the basis of evidence. Anyway, there obviously are thoughts that are not carried by, let alone identical with, bodily and thus material acts. In this, human thought differs from merely animal thought. Are we then to say that it is those unembedded thoughts that are spiritual acts? Surely, Anson replies, the immaterial nature of thought is there even when there is a fully blown material occurrence to identify as the occurrence of a thought. End of quote. In other words, to the immateriality and spirituality of thinking, the absence of material embodiment is not essential. What is essential to thought is the fact that even when embodied, it is not tied to the operation of an organ. In this it differs from functions such as seeing or hearing. Quote, thought and understanding are immaterial because no act of a bodily part is thought or understanding. Thought is not the activity of any bodily organ. End of quote. Now we come to section four on the handout. There is a lot more that Anson says in clarification of what should or what should not be meant or fancied in calling human thinking immaterial and spiritual. I shall have to skip most of this in today's lecture, but I must mention one point that is of central importance and one problem that I think she is aware of but does not solve. Both concern 
what might be called the purity of thought. We all know that in order to characterize any particular thought, we have to do so in terms of what it is of. This, we might say, is to characterize it directly or from inside and to give its essence. When we refer to a thought indirectly, as the thought, say, which so-and-so had when entering the room, we are merely locating and identifying it from outside, as it were. The specification is accidental to it. To know of any, any given thought what it is, is to know what is being thought in it. In order to understand the spirituality of human thought in general, we have to understand that its essence consists in its content. So that what any particular thought is and what distinguishes it from any other thought can be specified only and completely by specifying what it is of, what is being thought. This, I think, is Anne's consume and the background to what she has in mind when she says that, quote, the originally Platonic conception is right. The conception, namely, that the human mind, which could grasp the immaterial forms, had itself to be immaterial, end of quote. Perhaps we can add that on this understanding of the spiritual, the immateriality of thought consists in the fact that nothing material or sensory can represent things in the immediate, non-conventional and exclusive way that thought does, and that the conventions in virtue of which a sentence or a signal mean that something is the case are themselves of the nature of thought. The conventions are of the nature of thought. This feature of thought, its being nothing but representation, might be called its purity. Now, purity often has its price, namely disconnection. In the case of thought, it is difficult to see how any particular thought can be yours or anyone else's. For neither the thinker nor a representation of the thinker is part of a thought. And in the case of secret thoughts, there are no words or other thinking behavior that might be taken to tie those thoughts to the person who thinks them. They seem to be free-floating dangles. Thank you very much. This problem overlaps to some extent with the one addressed by, by a lecture that uh, Anskin gave and published in 1985 with a suggestive title Has Mankind One Soul? An angel distributed through many bodies. Here we read the intellect frames or somehow receives general concepts. If these general concepts are to be found in a lot of particular intellects then they are not general one could find particular examples of a general concept in all the particular intellects that had it. The general concept would have particular instantiation in the individual intellect, but that conflicts with what the intellect is supposed to have. It grasps, it grasps universals, the content of general terms. To this one wants to object, but you are confusing two kinds of generality and two kinds of instantiation. A concept's general application, its instantiation by many things falling under it, is quite compatible with its individual occurrence in indefinitely many intellects. That is, the multiple instantiation of that concept qua mental item. This objection, however, 
presupposes that a thought is a mental item, a mental item like an image, which gets its individuality from the individual in whose mind it is. But if a thought or concept is nothing but representation, there is no reality to it, to it, in virtue of which it could be ascribed to anything individual. There is no material or sensory basis. Anscombe says she does not know how to refute this idea and admits, at least at the end of that paper, quote, all I can say is that the individuation of intellects and of that by which they think, of what they think of, cannot, after all, be an in impediment to their understanding of what is general. Now, this is where I, too, want to leave the topic in order now to turn to the comparison between human and subhuman thinking. I'm going to leave out section 5 and turn to section 6. What should we say about the thoughts of non-human animals? Are we to say that they are just as spiritual as ours, or less so, but not quite material either? Anscombe does not address this issue, but I think reflection on it can actually lead us to a deeper understanding of what she does say. Let us then look at an example. It is possible to say of a cat that it thinks there is a mouse underneath the cupboard. Now, you too may on that occasion think there is a mouse, a mouse underneath the cupboard. Admittedly, while the cat's thought has to be manifested by behavior in context, yours may be manifested by behavior or by words or not at all. Nonetheless, it appears that what the cat thinks is the same as what you think. Now, this appearance, I want to say, is wrong. What the cat thinks is, in a decisive sense, not what you think. The appearance, to the contrary, is due to the fact that we have to render the feline thought by verbalizing a human variant of it. We put it in words, in the words of human language. We might, of course, copy the cat's thinking behavior. Um, well, we might do that, but this possibility does not show that our behavior would express the same thought as that of the cat, rather than the same thought as we could also express in the words the mouse is underneath the cupboard. That there is a difference between your thought and the cat's is indicated by the fact that we are ready to say the cat thinks there is a mouse underneath the cupboard. But not, for instance, the cat thinks that it is true that there is a mouse underneath the cupboard. Is this because we assume that the cat is unaware of the redundancy theory? that it is too dim to realize the equivalence between such and such, and it's true that such and such. I suggest that it is because the cat is too dim to think what you think in the first place. Even though both of you, you and the cat, can be described as thinking there is a mouth underneath the cupboard, there is a mouse underneath the cupboard. The question is how this might be proved. Can I prove that what you think differs from what the cat thinks? I'll try. To do it, however, I have to introduce to you, in addition to the parrot, turkey, the cat, and the mouse, yet another animal, um, this time the imaginary one called caveman. So we come to section, section 7. Unlike those other creatures, caveman is a language-using species, or so it seems. 
Are cavemen rational? Well, again, so it seems. Interestingly, Anscombe does not identify the spiritual nature of man with rationality. And in order to serve my argument, cavemen will have to turn out to be creatures that lack spirituality, whether we ought to ascribe rationality to them or not. So what are they like? Well, here is what you must know about them for the purpose of my argument. <clears throat> In some kind of public place that borders on their dwellings, they draw marks in the sand that covers that place. We managed to establish a strong correlation between the shapes of the marks and the behavior of the users as follows. First, an individual who has observed the presence of firewood, fruit, or herbs and plants in the surroundings tends to produce a mark whose components correlate with A, the kind of wood that he or she has observed, B, the direction as from the public place in which it was to be found, and see the number of steps that it took to get back to that place as directly as possible. So this is the first uh, kind of correlation that we have established. In the second one, Individuals who have looked at a particular mark will often walk away in the direction correlated with it and in accordance with the other two correlations take a certain number of steps, then look around for a certain kind of good, often find it and take it or some of it back home. It seems clear that the practice thus described represents a sort of communication in the service of the caveman's purposes with the marks functioning as symbols indicating the whereabouts of kinds of good. We shall be inclined to say that, by means of the marks, they tell each other where to find them, and that such a mark is taken to express the thought or judgment that food or whatever is to be found at such and such a distance, in such and such a direction from that public place. There are, however, problems about this assessment. Are we really entitled to describe the procedure in this way, in advance of knowing quite a lot about whatever further aspects characterize it? Obviously, the story can be developed in a number of different ways. Here is one such way which I invite you to consider. This is section 8. It sometimes happens that caveman that a caveman, ostensibly guided by his inspection of one of the marks, walks a certain distance and then looks around but returns empty-handed. Assuming that such a walk is undertaken for the usual sort of purpose, we shall look for an explanation of that kind of unexpected behavior. Upon examination of and reflection on a good many cases, we find that a number of explanations matching different types of case must be taken into account and in particular the following. This is on the back side of your hand. One, after discovering the kind of good that was signified by the mark that this statement has inspected, he loses interest or gets distracted. Second, he fails to see the kind of good in question. Third, what was indicated by the mark has, for whatever reason, disappeared. Sorry. <clears throat> Four, our caveman has failed to walk in the direction correlated to the mark. Five, he has failed to walk the right number of steps. Six, the steps he has taken were too small or too big. Seven, he has misread the mark. Eight, no goods ever corresponded to this particular mark. Nine, after having been produced, the mark was disfigured in a way such as to change significance. There may be different ways for account of accounting for the disfigurement. Sometimes the rain or strong winds have that effect, or the 
activities of giant ants or of children, at other times a mischievous adult is responsible. Now, <clears throat> given these facts, we can say the cave will typically rely on those marks, but the marks sometimes fail them, or their application sometimes succeeds and sometimes fails to succeed. Can we also say that those marks in the, sound, in, in the sand amount to information or statements that can be true or false? My list of distinguishable sources of failure does not yet enable us to answer this question. Whether cavemanese can count as esoteric language depends on yet further details of the story, and in particular on how the cavemen are represented as responding to failure. Let us then look at what happens when one of them has been let down by um, in connection with one of the marks. <coughs> this is section 9. As it turns out, the cavemen react with one and the same kind of disappointment to every abortive use of a mark. That is, in any of the cases that we should differentiate in terms of the ex of explanations 2 to 9 on your handout, they do not show any tendency to discriminate between these different ways of accounting for failure of remarks leading to success. In particular, nothing indicates that the cavemen distinguish between cases in which A. The mark that has failed to bring success has from the beginning been a bad guide. B. The mark, though indicative of goods when originally created in the sand, has been disfigured by the time of inspection in a way such as to give a wrong orientation. C. The mark, though produced by one of them in accordance with correct observations made by him, is now misleading because the goods in question have subsequently disappeared. And D. The mark fits the existence of goods all right, but the individual relying on it has failed to walk as indicated or has managed or hasn't managed to perceive those goods. Now the differences between these situations are not matched by any differences between the ways in which the cavemen handle them, in which they react to the failure. In other words, the cavemen take no notice of grounds of failure, and even less do they consider alternative possibilities of accounting for it. We may assume that they furiously swear it, or perhaps just disregard for the rest of the day a mark that has misled them, but nothing indicates that they try to discover what kind of misfortune, for example, from among the just the points just mentioned, A to D, what, any, uh, which one of these um, in particular uh, were responsible for lack of success. <clears throat> as far as I can see, the caveman's, the caveman's undiscriminating disappointment at a mark's failure to guide them to the satisfaction which it promises, means that they do not treat marks as assertions. When an English sentence that you are treating as an assertion lets you down, you will in principle allow for a number of different reasons why you do not find it confirmed. These will, assuming that tense is involved, include the following. Uh, these possibilities are again on the back of your handout. A. The sentence was never a true assertion. B. It was once true but is now obsolete. C. You have not done what you have to do in order to find the assertion confirmed. D. You have misunderstood the words. C. The words in which the assertion was expressed 
have undergone a physical change that affects their meanings, um, and there may be other possibilities. If you are unable to envisage these and other different possibilities, you lack the full notion of insertion. This notion involves a number of aspects relevant to the question whether Cavemanese is a language of assertions. Here are some of these aspects. We distinguish between the falsehood of an assertion on the one hand and a user's unawareness of the assertion's truth on the other. The cavemen don't have any such assertion. Again, the assertoric meaning of a sentence is not independent of the speaker's intention in uttering it. Merely physical causes can have no influence on an assertion's characteristic significance. Unless you are aware of these and other aspects of the notion, you cannot be said to make assertions or to understand and believe or disbelieve them. The kind of standard by which an assertion is judged to be true or false is more complex and more specific than the standard of success and failure or match and mismatch that guides the kind of reaction our cavemen show when their use of a mark results in disappointment and frustration rather than satisfaction. The most glaring deviation of the caveman's practice from the use of assertions seems to be due to the fact that their practice does not provide for a distinction between physical interference, as from children or ants, and other sources of failure. In this respect, the way in which they base their behavior on the perception of marks in the sand is more reminiscent of our reliance on the look of the sky for predicting the weather than our reliance on the late local weather forecast for the same purpose. I don't mean to suggest that the weather forecast is more reliable, only it signifies in a different way, namely by virtue of linguistic convention. In view of these observations, we may say that assertions, judgments, and beliefs differ from cavemen's use of marks in their inherent teleology. Quite apart from any further purposiveness, they are conceptually tied to standards which they are directed at satisfying, standards of assessment that have no application to cavemen's practice. Assertions, judgments, and beliefs are assessed as true or false, while the marks succeed or fail to succeed in procuring satisfaction. Use of the marks is essentially directed at some kind of non-theoretical success, and cave beliefs are disqualified by disappointment of expectation, whereas Assertions are, as such, directed at true representation and genuine beliefs are disqualified only by being false, or, more accurately, the standard of truth is the only standard to which something has to be answerable in order to count as a belief. Unlike, for example, guesses, Judgments, assertions, and beliefs aim not only at truth, but at knowledge. The marks of the caveman obviously don't. To do that, their use would have to involve the, the consciousness of error. Um, sorry. The consciousness that error is at least in principle possible. But the caveman react to failure in a way that does not distinguish what we would call would identify as error on the part of either the producer or the user of the mark from other ways in which production of or reliance on that mark leads to a disappointment. The profound disparity between human language and cavemanese can also be brought out by the following consideration. 
forgetting about my insinuation that the cavemen are liable to swear at a mark that has let them down, we can say that my description of the use of cave marks does not even discriminate between directions of fit. That is, the description supplies no reason for saying that a case of disappointment must give grounds for either blaming the production or employment of the mark or incriminating the reality for failing to correspond to the mark. Does all this mean that we cannot say of a caveman, for instance, he believed that some firewood was located 900 steps north of the public place? No, we can ascribe beliefs to cavemen on the basis of roughly their production of and reliance on marks in the sand, with at least as much justification as we can ascribe belief to many other animals on the belief on the basis of their behavior. But we should concede and then remember that cave assertions, cave judgments and cave beliefs are called assertion, judgment and belief by courtesy. It would be more appropriate to call them quasi-assertions, etc. For although they overlap, overlap to a considerable extent with their human cousins in formation, condition and function, they differ from them in essential respects, and especially in not admitting of truth or falsehood. Human judgment essentially includes awareness of the characteristic dimension of its assessment as true or false. You are not judging or even entertaining the thought that such and such, unless in doing so you are conscious that your thought is subject to the standard of truth and that in judging that such and such you are aiming at knowledge. This is now uh, section 13. The point of my story is of course to suggest that what is at the bottom of our spiritual nature is the human capacity for truth and to give some flesh to this suggestion. I have introduced the cavemen and their quasi judgment in order to elucidate by means of a contrast the notion of human thought as something that can be and wants to be true. And here is the proof that I promised I'd try to give that what the cat thinks about the mouse is never what, what you think about it. Like cave beliefs, the thoughts we ascribe to cats and dogs and many other animals are no more than quasi-thoughts. With respect to the cavemen who use conventional signs, we were able to articulate the difference between thought and quasi-thought in terms of the difference between falsehood on the one hand and disappointment of, the, of, re, um, disappointment of reliance on cave marks on the other. It seems clear that a fortiori animal behavior of a totally non-symbolic, non-linguistic kind is incapable of manifesting thoughts as opposed to quasi-thoughts. <clears throat> Though comparable in terms of practical function, cave monies is sufficiently dissimilar from the human employment of statements to be instructive, as it were, ex negativo, namely, to provide us with a background against which we can, we get a sharper view of the very special nature of our actual assertoric practice and of its relevance to the idea of reality. For this idea imports a contrast that is tied to the dichotomy between true and false propositions. There is thus no reality for cats and cavemen. What their cognitions are directed at is not reality. And what makes us spiritual beings is ultimately our ability to frame the notion of reality as something of which we are part and which is at the same time the measure of assessment to which our thinking relates 
by its very nature and inherent teleology. My argument comes down to this. We grasp what reality is by grasping what truth is. We grasp what truth is by understanding its connection with falsehood, and this we understand by comparing the way we fought assertions for being false with the way my cavemen fought their marks for creating unwelcome situations and dissatisfaction. Reality is what we treat as grounding the verification or falsification of assertions. Since nothing stands in this relation to cave marks, the language and the quasi-thought of cavemen cannot be said to involve consciousness of reality. And the same holds of the quasi-thought of brute animals. They are not conscious of reality. This is why I said not only is the cat's thinking different from yours, what it thinks is also different from what you think. These reflections may help us to appreciate some of Anscombe's seemingly strange remarks in a posthumously published paper on wisdom, where he characterizes our cognitive equipment and thereby human spirituality as the capacity to think and say that something is so, end of quote. Another quotation, the saying that by many propositions, she says this with reference to quite all my statements, is what gives them their enormous importance. This lies in the extremely usual, peculiar connection between a saying that and a reality. Section 15. In judging that such and such, you are conscious of subjecting your judgment and yourself as judger to an assessment that is not of your own choosing or any human choosing at all. In a similar way, the practical thought of a purpose and the will and intention to attain it involve the consciousness and endorsement of a standard. Anscombe certainly holds this view. I think it coincides with the doctrine put forward by Aristotle and Aquinas and nowadays debated under the heading The Guides of the Good that human action is as such directed at goodness and at particular objects qua ostensible goods. Now just as cavemen and a fortiori, a fortiori speechless animals manifest bland indifference to the norm of truth by manifesting a kind of behavior in which error has no place, they also exhibit free-thinking nihilism when it comes to question of good and bad. Their behavior is indeed directed towards what is good in accordance with the inclinations of their natures. But when that behavior fails to succeed or to match that standard, there's no way they would respond with regret, let alone remorse. And even more obviously, they would not exhibit as a human adult would, regret of purpose intended as opposed to regret of means employed, nor either of these as opposed to regret regarding uh, uncomplying circumstances. It is an essential aspect of human nature that we choose ways of acting and give relative weight to our various ends in light of a more or less explicit overall conception of how to live. A conception that directs us, for example, to give preference to family concerns over hobbies, or vice versa. This possibility of vice versa points to a feature which radically distinguishes specifically human from merely animal striving. 
The system of ends that directs our life can be bad because our overall conception of how to live can be bad and can be assessed by ourselves as bad and subject to criticism and revision. Human action, intention, and even ultimate purpose involve the consciousness of the possibility of badness. Where and only where this is present in a creature, its striving can be said to be oriented or guided by the good and thus to be of a, of a spiritual nature. These considerations bring us to an aspect of our spirituality that we have so far not explicitly considered, morality. Ernst can certainly thought, thought this aspect central to our spiritual nature. In a paper from the 1950s, for instance, she writes that the real, and quoting, the reason for speaking of the spirituality of the soul is not a quasi-physical common property, but that human beings are in for a final orientation towards or away from the good. Unfortunately, there's no time to pursue this topic any further. Perhaps the following will be a sufficient summary. <clears throat> Whatever you do in the everyday sense of acting is done in implicit awareness and acceptance of a norm. In acting, you are conscious not only of what you are doing, but also that by acting, you are placing this very acting and indeed your will, your life, yourself, under a norm of goodness that is not of your choosing. And it is in virtue of this consciousness of practical normativity that morality is an aspect of your spiritual nature. I come to the last section. Reflections on Ansconian lines thus lead us to the conclusion that the spiritual nature that distinguishes us from other animals consists in this. Qua human beings, we are all of a kind such as to be guided in our thinking and acting by the norms of truth and goodness. Is that all? Well, is it not enough? I should have thought that the values of truth and goodness are not in need of philosophical propaganda in order to play a central role in human life as well as in our conception of it. You may, of course, associate with the expression spiritual, if not esoteric, at least exalted things such as care of the inner life, religious attitude, meditation, or life. And this association is not altogether alien to Anscombe's treatment of the topic. She says that our attitude towards the spiritual nature of man has to be a religious one an attitude of respect before the mystery of human life. She speaks of concern with the immaterial part, as an expression for concern for the soul. She speaks of um, a man's mystical value, and she says that perception of what a human being is makes us perceive human death as awesome. But such expressions typically occur in passages concerned with a special dignity that attaches to human nature on account of its spirituality. They are not themselves meant to characterize the basis of the dignity, namely spirituality itself. The dignity of human life that is consequent upon its spiritual nature is of the greatest importance to Ants and ought to be so to anyone because of the far-reaching practical implications of this dignity. Indeed, what is here meant by dignity must be grasped and explained in terms of what we perceive as acknowledging or as violating it in the many ways that human beings can, can be and have been treated respectfully or um, degrading. 
Now, the care of one's inner life by meditation and the like may well be part of the appropriate acknowledgement of one's own human dignity. But Anscombe draws our attention to other, less spiritual ways of respecting our spiritual nature that are at least as important and probably more in need of being called to mind. Respect for human life in the dying and the unborn, reject, uh, rejection of degrading, degrading forms of sexuality and reproduction, rejection of cruel kinds of punishment, respect for the freedom and self-determination of people especially dependent on other support. All these things manifest recognition of man's dignity and lacking respect for it, Anson says, you cannot reveal the dignity of your own humanness. End of quote. The basis of this dignity, however, is man's spiritual nature. Even if we think, as Anscom does, that our spiritual nature rests on our being created by God in his image, it is plausible to hold that what makes us resemble God in our orientation toward, is our orientation towards truth and goodness. And if again that's them, we think that the claims of truth and goodness, whose perception grounds our spirituality, are in the last resort the claims of God himself, even then the notion of a spiritual nature seems to involve a reference to truth and goodness rather than to God. From this point of view, then, it seems right to say that the basis of our dignity is the nature that directs us towards the ends of truth and goodness by providing us with the consciousness of being subject to these ends as norms. This consciousness cannot find expression in the manifestations of a purely animal form of life. It characterizes the spiritual nature of man. 